What's up restaurant owners? Are you looking for some new strategies to elevate your restaurant? I am here with the guru, Roger Bodwin. He's from Restaurant Rockstars. He's got a great presentation that he's going to talk you through it. Roger, I'm just going to turn it over to you. What, what do you have for us? Hey, Court, thanks for having me here on the show. Yeah, I'm going to today I'm going to present um, three ways to maximize restaurant profit. I believe these are the biggest needle movers today in your operation. So with that said, let's take it away. And um, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. So 30 years ago, I started my first restaurant with no restaurant experience. Call me crazy. Be careful what you wish for. It might come true. And in my case, it absolutely was. I ended up founding um, five different restaurant concepts over 23 years of time. And so I'm a founder restaurateur. I'm also a podcast host. I'll tell you more about that later, but I'm the host of the weekly Restaurant Ruxers podcast. I founded several training systems based on my success and experiences in restaurants. The Restaurant Academy, I'll tell you more about today. I'll talk about the Sales Star Staff Training System today. I've written two different books, but one is restaurant related and it's called Rock Your Restaurant. And then I'm also a partner in a technology company that specializes in hospitality based in Seattle, and that's called Hospitality Innovation Lab. So that's just a little overview of what I've done, who I am, and, and uh, where we are today. So let's dive on in. So I believe that this business is all about systems. There's certain foundational s systems that I think are critical for success. And what made me successful was I was obsessed with a couple things. Service. I always believe that guest service, if you could provide better service than your competition, you would capture all the business. That was certainly true in my case. I was obsessed with brand building, and I was obsessed also with maximizing profit. Um, I'm really proud to say that my restaurants had double, if not more than double, the net profit of the average full-serve restaurant today. And I'm going to give you some of those techniques on how I achieved that today. And then my flagship restaurant, I'm still a customer there today on weekends mostly. And it's an iconic brand that, uh, you know, 30 years later, it still dominates the competition. Even though I sold it back in 2014, I, I built longevity with my staff. And I had people that worked for me for 18 and, and 19 years and even more so. And now when I go in as a customer, it's so gratifying to see that a lot of those people are still there. My employees, people I hired a long, long time ago are still turning on the guests to great dining experiences and, and sharing their secret formula for success. So I'm also a big believer in, in having a different approach to this business. And that's mostly what this is going to be about. I call it a paradigm shift because as the owner operators, we're really proud of what we've achieved but oftentimes we think we get really close to our business and we think, oh, I got this. And, and you might be comfortable with a certain level of success that you have now, or maybe you're just seeking greater success. But sometimes you got to walk out the front door and take a fresh look at your business from the outside in and even ask your guests what they think about your business, what your team thinks about your business. And it's all about staying relevant, but always giving them something new and staying ahead. So that's kind of the paradigm shift. And you'll see what I mean by that. So I'm also a personal restaurant coach, and I do work with restaurants um, across the country and even globally. I work with a lady in Mallorca. She's got two restaurants on the island of Mallorca, and she's a recent client. But nonetheless, whenever I work with somebody new, I usually ask them two different questions. What business are you in and what are you selling? And that may seem like a trick question, but it's not. And what you would expect to hear when I ask that question is, oh, I'm a restaurant owner or I'm a manager and we sell food and drink. <laughs> and I stopped them right there and I'm like, wrong. You know, when I ran restaurants, I was not in the business of running a restaurant. I was in the business of running a business. And those are two completely different things. And my products were not food and drink. They were entertainment, consistency, and a whole lot of good times. And that made all the difference for me. So you can kind of see that paradigm shift. That was my approach. It was not about running a restaurant. It was about building a business and building a brand and then selling entertainment and consistency and good times. So that's kind of what I'm all about. That's a mantra of mine. So the pandemic shifted everything in our business. So it turned everything upside down and sideways. And before the pandemic, and even now, it's very hard to break those old patterns. But 
I hate the word manager and management. I hate the word boss. I hate the word delegation. I am completely anti to all those things. And my paradigm shift is a new and different approach. And it is literally leadership, not management. Because I believe anyone can be promoted to a manager in a restaurant. Anyone can hold that title. But that does not mean that they're experienced. That does not mean that they're competent to lead. That does not mean that they inspire and get the best performance out of the team. And that's the difference. So leading by example means not being the boss, barking orders at people, not, you know, hiding in the office. It's literally about being involved in your team's lives and getting involved in their contributions in your business and seeing a spark in people and recognizing talent in others and seeing where they can fit and where they can go in their careers. Because your goal is to keep these people. You want to keep your people happy. You want to move them up in the organization. And it's okay if you've got an outstanding fry cook or a dishwasher, and if that's all they want to do, I'm fine with that. But there are lots of people that will leave you unless you give them opportunity to make great money and, and find a, a new path in their career, and, and you can provide opportunities, but you got to recognize that talent. So delegation, I hate that word because everybody uses it. It's overused, but it basically means to tell somebody what to do or even how to do it. Anybody can do that, but very few people can empower people to recognize talent, give them additional responsibility, you know, inspire them forward, um, not be afraid to let them take chances and even make mistakes. And instead of criticizing like a boss would, we critique and we always do that in private. And we also praise people when they do something right. And we always do that in public. Like I used to praise my people always in front of guests, in front of other team members. That's powerful stuff. So that's empowerment. But there has to be recognition and rewards to make the whole thing work. And we're going to talk about what some of those things are. The first thing you got to do is keep your people happy. It's like people are still struggling with this labor crisis. We're coming out of it now and more people are returning to restaurants, but there's still lots of restaurants out there that are having staffing issues. But the one thing you don't want to do is lose the good people you have. And in order to do that, you got to give them a voice. It's like when I, when I owned these restaurants, I always had an open door policy and people could knock on that door. The door was always open. Hey, Roger, you got a minute. And I would drop whatever I was doing because my people were the foundation of my business. And I was always happy to talk to them. And it was never annoying for me. It was always like, yeah, what's on your mind? You know, what can I do? And I recognized that, you know, that was empowerment unto itself when they weren't afraid to approach the boss or the owner. I, I never called myself the boss. I was a leader by example, but they were never afraid to talk to me. So I gave them a voice. And I'll tell you more about that because just before the pandemic, even though I'd sold all these restaurants, I had the brilliant idea of buying another restaurant. And I went through all that, you know, two years of hell, just like a lot of your listeners court are going through. But I'll talk about that in a second. MMDD on the top line. What does that mean? Now, this is not my idea, but I think it's brilliant because it's another way we can give people a voice. MMDD is something that another restaurant operator uses on a daily and weekly basis. And it can be either anonymous with an old fashioned suggestion box where people kind of put things in it, or it can be an email where they attach their name to it, but it stands for made my day difficult. What made my day difficult today? And then you read these things at the end of the shift or even first thing in the morning. It's like, if there's something that we can do to make our people's lives easier, more productive and happier, they're going to be happier here. They're going to be more productive team members. I love Made My Day Difficult because it gives them a voice and it gives them a chance to share. Because if you don't, you know, let your people know that you're open to their ideas, then they're just regular robots in your business just going about their daily duties and they're not going above and beyond and that is sort of a foundational to company culture which we're going to get into also okay flexibility you see it's got a question mark next to it because again when restaurants are short staffed how can we possibly be flexible flexibility means everyone has a life outside your restaurant the unexpected happens to all of us you know maybe you got a sick kid and you can't afford daycare or you got to be at home with this kid when you can't perform your shift. And this happens at a moment's notice. All 
kinds of things happen. Doctor's appointments, things happen in our employees' lives, and we really need to be flexible to that. And the only way we can do that and still make the business go on and work is if we cross-train people. Now, one of the benefits in my business was I had multiple people that could do multiple things. And that's because we cross-trained them. So I had dishwashers that could be fry cooks, and I had hosts that could be bussers, and I had servers that could be bartenders. And we gave them additional training to do this. And some people would say, oh, well, that costs a lot of money. They're on payroll, and I'm training them to do something else. Well, that's the wrong approach. It's really about an investment in your future. Because if you've got cross-trained people that can do multiple things, when the unexpected happens, you've got a backup plan. Merit raises are really important. You know, people want to know that you recognize what they're doing and that they're earning their way forward. So if you give them additional responsibility or if they're just outstanding at what they do, even if they're the dishwasher, the fry cook, from time to time, we have to do this. We're going to talk a little bit later in this about how we can pay for these high labor costs, which are crushing today. But I've got some ideas for that. Incentives for meeting goals. I'm going to get into more detail about that. And then fix what's broken. Let me go back to that restaurant I bought before the pandemic. It was a turnaround situation. It was your grandma's breakfast place, old fashioned lunch and breakfast counter, the old fashioned booths and all that kind of stuff. And I bought it for a couple of reasons. I bought it because it was gonna be an investment. I didn't wanna work there. I just wanted to systemize it, get strong leaders to run it, and then work on improving its value. It had two apartments over it. It had a beautiful barn that we were gonna think about turning into a wood-fired pizzeria, you know, and a bar with an outdoor courtyard. The Italian lights have acoustic music out there besides your grandma's lunch counter. So we saw this opportunity. We owned it for a couple of months and then the pandemic hits. But before any of that happened, you know how people can sometimes get really scared. It's like people like to be in their comfort zones. And when a business changes hands and there's a new owner, the existing staff get really worried sometimes. It's like, oh, is this guy going to be a jerk? Is he going to change everything? Is he going to be difficult to work for? It's like, I don't like change is what the typical feeling is. And I knew this, right? So I I tried to make people comfortable right off the bat. So in the process of of just taking over this business, I sat down with each and every team member personally, explained a little bit about myself, what I'd done before, about what the plans were for the business. And then I asked them, I'm like, you know, you tell me what's going on here. What makes your life difficult? What makes your life hard? Is there anything we can do to make things happier for you, easier for you? We're willing to do that. And they sang like canaries. It's like I had a baker and she had to put out all these giant cinnamon buns every day, fresh baked muffins, like huge batch of baking. She'd get there at five in the morning. She'd have to have everything ready for 630. And she's like, you know, that mixer, sometimes it works fine. And other times I'm in the middle of the dome and the thing just stops and I have to kick it or jiggle the plug or whatever. And it's a real downer. We fixed the mixer. The kitchen guy says, the kitchen is so hot. There's no ventilation here. It's 900 degrees. We're on our feet for six hours. There's no rubber mats in front of any of the equipment. We went out and we bought them those, you know, those Skecher shoes, the really cushy Skecher shoes. We brought in the rubber mats. We air conditioned the kitchen. We made their lives a hundred times better. They were happy with that. So I guess the key here is you don't ask, you don't get, but it's really critical to create that rapport with your team where you're the leader, you're not the boss, you're not the jerk barking orders. It's like you care about their well-being, their futures, you give them opportunities and you recognize and reward them for outstanding achievement. Let's go back to recruiting, not hiring, because you can drive down. I know you see this, Court. I know your audience sees this. It's like, I don't care where you are, Toledo, Ohio, San Francisco, Anywhere in this country, you drive down the street, you see a hundred now hiring signs on the changeable message boards. You see them in the window. You walk into a business, now hiring. You even see it on the back of trucks driving around. We're now hiring. What happens then is you're getting somebody else's nightmare employee if you get anybody at all that way. You know, it's like there are three types of employees in any business, but we're talking restaurants here, and this applies to restaurants. We have A, B, and C players. Now, the C players are the people that aren't doing your business any favors. They're probably turning your guests off completely. These are the people that just show up for a paycheck. They're not motivated. Sometimes they're there. Sometimes they're not. They're calling in late. They're calling in sick. They're out back having a smoke out the time. It's like you don't need or want these people 
even though the mindset today is I need warm bodies on the floor to run my business, I'll put up with a certain level of that because I need people. Well, again, I think they're doing more damage to your business. You got to weed the garden and instead you got to focus on your A and B players. So every business has at least one, hopefully more A player. And that goes without saying. It's someone with, with a great personality that has a true desire to serve the public, that is experienced, that gets along well with others. People like them, right? They have the right approach. They're ambitious. They want to move up in an organization. You wish you had 20 people like that or more, right? Mm -hmm. And the B players are just like that also. They have all the similar attributes. The only thing they might be missing is Maybe they never worked in a restaurant before. Maybe they lack that experience or a little bit of polish. They're going to become A players. And that's where mentoring and shadowing comes in. I'm a huge believer in using your A players to bring up the B players and demonstrate best practices. We never turned anybody loose either in the kitchen or on the floor unless they shadowed an A player, if not two or three A players. And, and people have different personalities and different styles. And what works for this one doesn't work for that one. But you can pick up great things if you shadow a couple different people. Okay, let's go back to the recruiting piece because I don't want to get off track. When I started my first restaurant 30 years ago, there was a hotel coming into my town. At the same time I'm opening this restaurant, a new hotel is being built and it's going to open around the same time. And they need hundreds of people from valet parkers to housekeeping staff to servers and bartenders and you name it, they needed it. And I'm thinking, how am I possibly going to get 20 people to staff this restaurant when this place needs to hire hundreds of people? And it wasn't a huge community. So I'm like, I was worried about that. I had one A player. And I said, who do you know that isn't happy in their current job that you think would fit this culture that we're trying to develop here? And I'm going to tell you about what that culture was, but we were doing something unique and different and special. We were going to recognize people. We we're going to reward them. We we're going to train them. It's like we're going to give them real possibilities for the future. And I said, if you bring me any of those people, I'm going to give you 100 bucks for every person like yourself that you, that you think would fit this culture and would do great here. She brought me three people. And then one of those people brought me two people and I paid this hundred bucks and 30 years ago, paying out hundred dollar bills to people just to get people in the door, right? That was an investment, not a cost. But I realized now, and even then it costs you thousands of dollars to get a C player in the door. The average tenure of a restaurant employee, they say a typical employee is three to four months. And you hire this person and you train them or get them up to speed in the job. And then three months later, you either fire them or they leave on their own. And now you got to do it all over again. So lost time, wages, productivity, and training costs you about 4000 bucks every time that happens. No restaurant can afford this. And it was similar back then. It was probably a couple thousand dollars. So I'm like, I'm going to pay a $100 bill to get great people. And then I'm going to give those great people... 200 bucks if they last two months and do a great job and if they assimilate our culture. And then I knew if we trained them for two months and if we recognized and rewarded them, chances are they weren't going to leave. And that turned out to be true. We fully staffed our restaurant by recruiting, not hiring. It's really in interesting because there are now temporary agencies in many states that specialize in hospitality employees. I know there's one in my state, but whether you have a hospitality-specific temp agency, there are pretty much temp agencies everywhere. And if you need short staff on short notice, intelligent people that can jump in and learn quickly, and then maybe if you treat them great, they might stay with you. Who knows? But this is just one website here for a company that specializes in hospitality, gotlanded.com. And uh, I definitely recommend that you check them out. Um, here's a genius idea. I didn't think of this. Wish I did, but I love to share. There's a restaurant chain in Southern California that has 28 locations and they're open three day parts a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner times 28 locations. You think they had a challenge with, with, you know, finding and keeping great people when all this craziness hit, they absolutely did. And they came up with this idea that we're going to give gift cards to our best guests or any guests really, that is a customer here. And we're going to give them a $250 gift card for any referral that comes in the door that does a great job for 60 days. So 
you know, common sense dictates that it didn't cost this restaurant 250 bucks per gift card. It's the cost, it's their food cost. So if they had a 28% food cost, it's 28 cents on the dollar. It's not 250 bucks or a dollar on a dollar. So I thought that was genius. And they're able to fully staff 28 locations and rock and roll. So there's another idea. Again, a reasonable trial period. I think two months is fair. You reward the guest who refers, you reward the staff person that comes in the door, sort of a sign on bonus. You do a great job for us. You know, in, in 60 days, I'm going to give you 200 bucks or whatever it is. And it's an investment, not a cost. And then a lot of restaurants do not um, put enough um, emphasis on the power of internal marketing. It's like, it's, everywhere in your restaurant you got four walls 10 walls whatever it is and you got lots of locations that are visible to your guests and you can you can advertise for team members in a variety of ways whether that's on social media giant chalkboards on your menus your table tents your bulletin boards in the bathrooms whatever and you might get some great people and it's all about recruiting with incentives so that worked really well for me i know it's working for others today so check that out all right Hospitality, family, and fun is the company culture that I built. Now, I hate, here's another paradigm shift. I, I am not about mission statements. Too many companies have what they call the mission statement. It kind of hangs on the wall. Nobody reads it. Nobody cares about it. Nobody practices it. Instead, a company culture is something that, you know, is an aura. It's an image. It's what people feel about working for you. And if you were to query or take a survey of all your team members today and say, what is it, you know, what do you think our culture is? What do you think it's like to work here? There would be a common thread between a lot of what people say. And that's the foundation of your culture. But then you have to build that up and nurture it. So hospitality, family, and fun was my culture because hospitality is the foundation of our business, okay? And I'm going to tell you what my definition of that is in a minute, but I wanted the team to feel like family. I wanted our guests to feel like family, and I wanted everyone just to have fun. And that was wonderful. The guests were having fun, and the team was having fun, and it elevated everything. And there's just this sort of aura where a guest walks through the door and they just know that a place is running on eight cylinders, not four. It's not controlled chaos. It's team spirit. It's respect. It's camaraderie. It's amazing dining experiences. It's service and it's hospitality. But that comes with accountability. We're going to talk about that now. I mentioned that I'm a personal coach and an Another thing I ask, the second thing I usually ask my clients is, do you have job descriptions for every position in your restaurant? Nine times out of 10, they don't have job descriptions. And I'm like, okay, well, there's why you have no accountability. I'm hearing lots of complaints like, why do my people not perform the way I, want, I expect them to? Why do my people show up late? Why are they just kind of here? And it's like, you know, it's like I tell them what to do and it's like they just don't do it. And they blame it on the mindset of the employee. But in reality, you as the owner, if you're acting as a boss, you're failing these team members. But you can fix all that with a job description. So a basic job description has three elements that are really important and powerful. I always started with something I called key success factors at the very top of any job description for any position in the business. And this changes for every position, but you figure out some keywords, single words or two word, you know, phrases or whatever that are what you think that the person brings to the table to be successful in that job. And it might be reliable. It might be accuracy with cash. It might be, you know, detail oriented. It might be hustle. It might be personality, it, a combination of those things, but write down five or six words that you expect that person to bring to the table. And when you sit down with this person, whether they're a new hire or an existing team member, you say, this is what I need you to be, to be successful here. The main body of a job description has primary responsibilities, and that might be five things, that might be 10 things or more. It varies with each job, but it's your job to be, as a leader, an owner, or a leader in your business, to really have a solid understanding of what you expect in every position, to understand that job and then understand high expectations and what the performance should be. So in each one of those primary responsibilities, you very accurately detail what you expect. What is your standard and what do you want to see for all this to be accomplished? And then next to every one of those responsibilities is a blank line. 
And I'll tell you why. When you sit down with a new hire or someone who's been working with you for a while, you, you read this to them, you share it with them. They have a copy in their hand. You've got a copy. And then after each one, you say, do you understand what my expectations are for you to be successful in this responsibility? Can you do this to the best of your ability? If the answer is yes, you have them initial that line. There's the accountability. Sometimes these responsibilities require some training. So, of course, we're going to train you on what those expectations are. But once you're trained, do you understand what I expect? Can you do this? If they say yes, if they initial yes, then two weeks later, two months later, you notice their, their performance going sideways or it's not meeting that expectation. Here's your proof. You sit them down in private and here's the critique, not the criticism. And you throw the ball in their court and you say, you told me here when you initialed this that you understood what I expected and that you could perform to the best of your ability. I'm not seeing that. And then instead of saying, get out there and do it right, like a boss would, you say, what can you do to get your performance back on track so that you're meeting these expectations? And then you sit there and you wait for the answer. And now they've, they're on the spot now. They have to go out there and fix and correct the behavior. There's the accountability. They know you're going to be watching. They know what you expect. And they don't want to be called on the carpet a second time. And that is very powerful stuff. The third part of the job description is, and you got to think about this over time, because if certain people are just great at what they do and they stay there, it may not be relevant for them. But here's the part where you want to move people up. You say, if you do a great job in all these you know, primary responsibilities, here's the next step for you. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and I will recognize you for doing that. And if you perform well, there's going to be a bonus or an incentive in it for you. And there's a carrot on that job description. It's something for them to shoot for. And that's powerful stuff. Okay, that's the accountability piece. You got to be fair and completely impartial. You can never ever show favoritism of any people. You might have an A player that you absolutely love and it's okay to praise those people, but you can't ever show that I favor that person. It's just it's just not right and it and it sends the wrong message really. Okay, there's a book that I recommend, and you'll see at the bottom it's I Have One Minute Leader. The actual real title of this is The One Minute Manager, and I crossed that out on my copy because I don't like that word. Instead, it's about leadership. But really quickly, just as an overview, it's a really simple read. It's less than 100 pages. There's not a lot of words on every page, but it's essentially how I ran my businesses for 30 years. Whenever you catch somebody doing something right or great, you praise them. They call that a one minute praise. But that's just the title of the book. It doesn't have to be 60 seconds. It could be 10 seconds, five seconds. It could be two minutes. You, you know, it's up to you. But essentially, you're catching somebody doing something wonderful or amazing. You praise them for that. Same thing when something's going sideways, we have the one minute critique, not criticism, where you sit somebody aside in your office. I already went through all that and you put the ball in their court. So the book kind of gives you a, a detailed account of how that really works, but I recommend it for everyone and it's easy to find anywhere. All right. Make it fun. Keep it fun. Here's the recognition rewards piece. This was really powerful for me. Um, I created this. You can use this or you can sort of use a takeoff of this or come up with your own ideas, but I'll tell you how powerful it was. Weekly recognition rewards. We had a program called Difference Dollars in all my restaurants, and here's how that worked. Um, whenever someone made a difference, they helped a team member, they solved the guest problem, whatever it was, if it was something over and above their job description that really stood out, maybe I recognized them or saw them doing this, or another team member knocked on my door and said, hey, Roger, did you hear about what Sally did today? No, tell me about what Sally did today. Oh, they're going to win Difference Dollars. Okay, that's how people got nominated, right? So Fridays and Saturdays are usually the busiest days in our restaurants. And not everybody works on a Friday. Not everybody works on a Saturday. And I really wanted every, I had 55 team members in my biggest restaurant. And I wanted everyone to be part of this program every week. So I did it twice. So before the start of service on a Friday and a Saturday, I called the whole team that was working that day together in the dining room or in the kitchen. I got up on my soapbox. And I said, and this week's winner was, they all look forward to this, by the way. It was kind of fun once they got used to it. 
This week's winner is Sally Johnson, and this is what Sally did that made a difference. And I would go into glowing detail about Sally's difference. Everyone would clap, hooray, Sally, pat her on the back, whatever. I would give Sally a $20 bill and a can of Red Bull, and I would thank her very much for making a difference. And that was the simple piece. That was the recognition and the reward. But it didn't stop there. I went into my office, and I had a template on the computer with big stars in the corners and big and bold that said difference dollars. And then I typed Sally's name in big and bold, and then also in bold, in glowing detail, I typed what the difference was. And then we framed these things. I had a whole bunch of frames in my office from Target or Walmart or whatever, you know, the computer paper, eight and a half by 11 frames, you know. And we framed these differences and we hung them up in the kitchen, in the employee area, in the employee bathroom where they hung up their coats. When I sold that place in 2014, there had to be three or 400 of these differences plastered everywhere. There's barely any room to keep putting them up. And it was so gratifying because whenever I hired somebody new, whenever they were on a 10, 15 minute break, having a soda, whatever, I couldn't help but notice they're walking the line and they're reading about some of these differences. And it spoke volumes about our culture, about how we treated our team, about what our expectations were. And we didn't have to fire people anymore. It's like they either fit that culture or they kind of voted themselves off the island. And it was so awesome because that's what created the longevity, the recognition, the rewards. The second powerful piece was prizes. There's that you don't ask, you don't get thing again, right? Every one of us in a restaurant spends lots and lots of money with a variety of suppliers that we buy from. Food service suppliers and liquor suppliers and beer distributors and fresh linens and you name it. It goes on and on and on. One day I was at one of my liquor distributors just having a meeting about you know business or whatever it was. I'm walking by a conference room on this tour of their new facility or something, and I see all this valuable merchandise sitting on a table, and there's sporting goods, and there's electronics, and there's neon signs, and there's clothing. There's all this stuff, and I just happen to say, hey, what's all that? And the person that was giving me the, the meeting or the tour said, you know, we work with lots and lots of suppliers also, and we ask them every year for a bunch of valuable stuff that we can use as employee incentives. But he goes, we have so many suppliers and they give us so much stuff. It's like, it's kind of a problem that a lot of this stuff ends up collecting dust in the warehouse and then we're losing our warehouse space. And then we have to figure out what I'm like, wow, I've been doing business with you for years. And I go, I spend a lot of money with you every year. I'm like, can I have any of that stuff? I'd love to use it for employee incentives. The very next day, the truck shows up and everything that was on that table shows up at my back door. Wow, that's awesome. I had to clean out a supply closet and put all that stuff in there. And then whenever we caught somebody doing something great, that one minute praise thing, I'm like, hey, let's take a trip to the closet. And I loved when they were a new employee. It's like they were, they had no idea about the closet. They're like, oh, what do you mean? You know, I'm like, no, thanks. You're doing a great job. Hey, come with me for a sec. I'd open the door and I'd say, see anything you like? It's yours. And their eyes would light up and they're like, really? It's like, how powerful was that? So people would walk away with valuable stuff and they could pick out anything they wanted. And then we started to have that problem because we then went to every supplier and asked them for stuff because we've been building this relationship and spending money with them for years. And then we had a lot of merchandise that we could give out as guest incentives. We started a mug club that had 1,200 members. And we, we could program these loyalty cards where every time a mug club member swiped it through the POS, meaning they gave the card to their server, or their bartender, whenever they bought a meal or a beer or whatever, and this thing would randomly award prizes and they could walk out with something. Hey, let's take a trip to the closet. You're the winner today, you know? And all this built loyalty with guests and loyalty with team members. So powerful stuff there. Hey. One thing, if yeah, I, I love this idea and I yeah. love the idea of the framing the pictures and my marketing brain yeah. is going to every time you could take a picture of the person holding the like thing they did, put it on social media that tells oh, yeah. your customers, hey, we've got this really good person doing great Superstar. stuff, but it also helps future employees see, look at how employees are valued. So I mean, did you tell that story? I mean, this might have been before social media and such. It was. It actually was. And yeah, you're right. Do you think? I mean, oh, I think that's a fabulous uh, extension to this idea because you want to recognize your team in front of staff. I mm -hmm. mean, in front of guests. And we did it 
live on site at the restaurants, but now mm. with social media and all that kind of stuff, you want to tout your best people and give people reasons like, hey, we got to check that place out. They really care about their people. Their people are going to care about us. I think that's I think that's absolutely spot on court. Thanks for yeah, sharing that. I think that's brilliant. Oh my God, that's great. And, and and again, you know, there there are very few original ideas now. You can take a germ of an idea that someone else has done. You can put your own spin on it like you just did, make it even better, improve it. But again, I mean, you got to always have your eye out. I was always one to shop other businesses and try to get ideas for my business, even if it wasn't a restaurant. You know, it's like best practices. Wow, that's a cool thing. We're going to put that in now. You know, you always got to keep your eye. That's that fresh perspective I talked about. Take a look from the outside in. See what others are doing and then play your best game. Yeah. So now we've got leaders, right? And we want to empower them to take on more responsibility. And I guess the crux of this point is there's far too rest, too many restaurant owners that I meet that are tied to their businesses seven days a week. And part of that is because of the challenges they've been through with the pandemic. And part of that is because of the staffing. But if we could solve some of those problems and empower our people to run and treat our business as if they own that business. I call that an entrepreneur. Everyone knows that an entrepreneur takes a risk to start a business in hopes of making a profit. But very few people know that an entrepreneur is someone that applies that approach, even though they're an employee in someone else's business. And that's how you rise up in an organization. That's how you set yourself apart from other people working there. That's how you make more money. That's how you get more job fulfillment. That's how your career grows, right? So empowered leaders grow your brand and your business. And there's several ways they can do that. So we always gave leadership bonuses for key results. So some of these things might be creating a loyalty program. So maybe if you've got, most restaurants call them GMs or general managers. I call them general leaders. We had a general leader. We had a dining room leader. We had a bar leader. We had a dining room leader. You know, our biggest restaurant had lots of leaders, but we empowered each of those people to take on something new to grow the business. And then we always gave them a, a an incentive for doing so, whether that was a bonus or a piece of the action, we did it both ways. So creating a loyalty program, increasing your takeout and delivery business, starting a catering program or private parties and events, the mug club thing I talked about, my bar leader created this mug club and we started small with like 20, well, let me back up. Everyone probably knows what a mug club is, but you walk into these bars and the mugs are hanging and a lot of people, unless they actually belong to the club, they don't really know how it works. But people pay a membership fee to have this exclusive mug that doesn't go home with them. It stays in the business, but it's numbered and it's hanging over the bar. And then they're recognized for being a member of this club. And the mugs have more volume than a standard pint glass. A, you know, a standard pint glass is 16 ounces. Well, the mugs are 20 ounces. They could be 22 ounces. So they're actually getting more beer. And you might discount the price of the beer, or you might keep it the same price as a 16-ounce pint, but there's value added there. But it's this exclusivity where people suddenly feel like, that's my place, and I'm going to tell my friends to join. And then the thing kind of grows like coral, and they feel special because instead of holding the pint glass like the average customer, they've got this really cool mug. And you let them decorate the mug with stickers or Sharpies or artwork, whatever you want. It's like, it's their mug to do what they want with. And the most powerful thing about it was you can get it sponsored. So there's no cost to it. So you can find radio stations or other businesses that you do business with that want to reach your customers through this mug club. And then they put their logo on the mugs and they print you t-shirts with their logo on the t-shirts that say mug club member and all that kind of stuff. And that's value added too. So it doesn't have to cost you anything, but the key is you sell memberships and we used to sell them for $55 a piece each year. So you get an income stream now where people pay you up front for value they're going to receive in the future. And you want them to come in and you want them to spend money. But in some cases, people pay you 55 bucks and you never see them again. So that's called breakage. But either way, you're making money. But the kicker is you're making money because these people now come into your business more frequently than they would if they were just regular customers. So before, if you got a popular restaurant, you might see a regular maybe twice a month, maybe three times a month if you're lucky. That's a lot, right, for a regular 
But now these people join the mug club and they're in your place two, three, four times a week and they're buying the beer and they're eating the food. And then you start a retail merchandise program and they're buying your t-shirts and all that kind of stuff. And that's core business building right there. So really quickly, we started with like 25 mugs just to see what would happen. I empowered my bar leader to do so. And he sold out the 25 in like a day or two. And then we ordered more mugs and he sold those out and he sold those out. And the thing just grew and grew, and he really knew how to promote this thing, right? So I gave him an incentive. He got, he got like five or seven bucks for every single mug he sold. Do you know that when I sold that business in 2014, he had sold that club to have 1,200 mug club members. The mugs were everywhere. He ran out of space to hang these mugs wow. and he got a piece of the action for every single one. But imagine that, that was $60,000 a year in free and clear cash to my business that people would renew every single year and it was fully sponsored so that the sponsor paid for the mugs and paid for the t-shirts and paid for the, those loyalty cards and all that stuff was paid for. It was no cost to my business. I just collected the money. But the kicker was, like I said, now people are in two and three and four times a week spending money, spending money. And then the prizes were reinforcers. You know, they'd sit down and have a beer and they just won a pair of skis or a tennis racket or an iPad or something cool because my suppliers gave us all this free stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really powerful. So starting a mug club is an idea and you can incentivize somebody to take that on if you sell draft beer in your business. If you have a coffee shop, you can start a mug club. It works for coffee shops. It works for draft beer, that kind of stuff. I always empowered my leaders to lower or keep their costs, keep my costs, food costs, beverage costs, labor costs, all that stuff in the sweet spot. And I would track this stuff every single week. And if they stayed there, they would get a percentage. They'd get a nice incentive for staying in that sweet spot because low costs mean higher profits in your business. Come up with cash cows. You cannot have too many cash cows in your business. For those, I know we've all heard that term, but just to refresh your memory, a cash cow is anything that has very high perceived value. When you put it in front of the guest, it has what I call wow factor. It looks like a dynamic menu item. It looks amazing. It smells amazing. It's going to taste amazing, but it doesn't cost very much to serve the guest. It's almost pure profit. That can be a byproduct of something else. It's like you can come up with some pretty uh, amazing cash cows. And I probably had four or five of them in my restaurant. It lowers your food cost. It increases your profit. And you can even afford to give these things away working with other businesses that'll drive you business. Give a free offer. Hey, if your customers come in with this coupon, I'll give them a free X. And then I'll give you a kickback in trade for every dollar that comes in the door. And that's a powerful program. I could talk about that all day long. Everything I'm talking about, Court, by the way, to your audience, is all a template. It's all in, a, in something we call the academy that I'll talk about later. So if people are taking down notes right now and really absorbing this stuff, that's great. But just know that this whole thing is available in a turnkey template at the end of the program. But anyway, all right, ordering efficiency. That's really important. If you've got a kitchen manager or bar manager, it's really important that they know how to order efficiently so that there's not too much product and there's they're not running out of the 86 ing stuff and that nothing is getting wasted or spoilage or even stolen, right? Because that loses you money. The margins in this business are low enough already, but if you've got a waste of spoilage and a theft program, it's like your margin's going even lower and there go the profits. So I incentivize my leaders to stay with strong ordering, sweet spots, all that kind of stuff, lots of cash cows, and they all got a piece of the action for that. And then lastly, I had a kitchen leader that um, would come up with these off the menu specials that were just to round out the regular menu, gave my service team something special to talk about at the tables, and every one of these was more profitable than our regular menu items. And they, were, they would change all the time. And that was a draw for our guests because they could get something new on the menu. So these are all just some ideas on how you can incentivize your leaders. Okay, here's where we took the leadership piece down to the line staff, the regular line staff. Once a month, I would have a brainstorming session and we'd have the flip charts on the walls with lots of Sharpie markers. And the very first time we did this, people weren't quite sure what to expect, but I had my entire team there again. And yeah, sure, for 30 minutes, I'm paying them on the clock. But here's the shtick of this. I said, you guys are in the trenches every single day. You see things. You see things that work. You see things that don't work. You come up with ideas 
of how to improve efficiencies. How can you, if you see a way that we're losing money, cutting our costs, if you see a way of increasing sales, increasing profits, um, marketing ideas, anything is fair game. Throw any crazy idea you have at the wall. And I'd be up there writing on the flip charts. And then I said, okay, I'm going to take all these ideas and no idea is a stupid idea. It really isn't, right? Because I might see your idea. I might put a spin on it and it might go a different direction. But I go, I'm going to pick some of these things. If I can track either it saves us money or it increases our profits in some way, if I can track what that dollar or percentage is, then I'm going to give you a piece of that action as long as you work for me and as long as that idea continues to perform. You know, some of those ideas, I had people that worked for me for 16 years and they were getting extra pay in their paychecks because this was their idea. <laughs> and, and it continues to work and it continues to drive the bottom line. I don't see businesses that do this. It was just a wacky idea one day that turned into a huge... And, and was there a cost to that? Absolutely not. You know, if it cost me a couple hundred bucks to sit these people down in, in the meeting once a month, it's like the thousands and thousands of dollars in savings and increased profit that came from there. I'm not the genius here. I'm not the only guy that, you know, I, I was just smart enough to empower my people to say, you guys are valuable. I treasure and value what you have to say. I give you a voice. I want your ideas. It's like everybody works here. Everybody can improve the place. So if I can track it, or if you can track it, give your people a reward, it'll just put your business over the top. All right, let's talk about how to pay these high labor costs, because that is seriously a challenge right now. We are paying the highest labor ever, especially in the kitchen, than we ever have before, and it's really hurting businesses. I always used to trade for things. You know, you don't ask, you don't get. We buy, again, lots and lots of stuff for our restaurants from lots and lots of suppliers. And if there's a way that we can trade for some of this stuff by letting people come into our restaurant and sign the check as opposed to paying for it, again, it's pennies on the dollar. You can trade for artwork on the walls where the artist sells their stuff. You take a percentage of that. You got free artwork. It's, it's a win-win for everybody, right? I used to always trade gift cards for gift cards also. I would go out to different businesses, not restaurants, but retail shops and you know movie theaters, whatever, convenience stores. It didn't matter. I'd meet the owner or the manager or the leader, I should say. And I would say, hey, I will give you 20, $25 gift cards to my restaurant if you'll give me 20, $25 gift cards to your business. And now I've got something in my pocket that's an incentive whenever I catch somebody doing something right. I don't need to give them a raise, but if I'm giving lots of these incentives that cost me pennies on the dollar, it's a lot better than me giving dollar per dollar. So again, pennies on the dollar. The cash cow thing we talked about, you can't have too many cash cows because they lower your costs, they increase your profits, and the more profit you have, the more you can share the wealth with your team. The most powerful part of this presentation is coming up, but it's literally about maximizing the profit on every sale. Because the one thing, the two things we cannot control in this business are inflation and these high labor costs. We can't go in reverse. We don't control the volatile markets out there with food costs. We don't control high labor costs if we want to compete and get good people. You know, you, you drive down the street every day and you see now hiring 20 bucks an hour, 22 bucks an hour. It's very hard. You can't go in reverse now. So the only thing you can do is maximize the profit on every sale. Be really resourceful. Turn over the rocks, I call it. All right. Hey, I'm, I, I'm just because I think that's yeah. brilliant. The gift card for gift card idea is mm. brilliant. You know, employees don't want a gift card to the place they work. That's lame. Nope, but don't. if you can get them gift cards somewhere else, and then my marketing brain is going, then you can promote, hey, Sally one got this gift card to... Joe's Crab Shack or whatever, or down the road, whatever. And there's cross promotion, collaborative things where, and then they can promote you back and forth. I mean, I think that's brilliant. Great idea. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm really glad that that point resonates. And, and I really hope that that's something that's workable. I, I know it is. It, it all comes down to execution, but these ideas are powerful ideas if you execute them. It, and I'm going to get into that. Go ahead. Well, and you're all sharing, restaurants are sharing the same customers, right? And kind of the mm -hmm. same people, yeah. you know, in the same general area. And if you can collaborate with local businesses, maybe you're going to talk about that. I mean, I, I just think that's super smart. So. 
Uh, if you want me to go into detail on that, I can. This is how it worked. Sure. Let's go back to the cash cow idea. Okay. So my very first restaurant was a wood-fired brick oven pizzeria, and it was a point of pride that we made our dough from scratch every single day. We didn't buy dough from a supplier. We made it from scratch. And then we also made our own sauces and all that kind of stuff. And we obviously had lower costs because, you know, we, we were very efficient in the process, but my cash cow was wood-fired garlic knots. And maybe you've seen these in restaurants before, but we had one size pizza only because I wanted to be authentic to how they make pizza in Italy. And if you go to any pizzeria in, in the country of Italy, you don't get a small, a medium, or large. It's not American pizza. It's a one size, usually a 12-inch personal pizza. So we did it that way. We had a a dough roller that was this professional piece of equipment where we would we would have a, a standard dough ball that we my people would they'd make the big 60 quart mixer hobart every single minute and they'd make all this fresh dough and then they'd portion it out rock solid portion standards were important to us so we had a standard dough ball of so many ounces they would put it into the pizza roller and it would come out as a flat piece of dough that would then go into the oven or whatever I mentioned 12 inch pizza. So we had all these pizza pans and whenever they put a piece of dough on top of that pizza pan, it would always overflow the pan by about a half an inch or three quarters of an inch all the way around. So they took one of those pizza wheel cutters and they would trim that dough and then they would tie that into knots. They would take, you know, a food quality paintbrush. They would brush it with olive oil. They would sprinkle just a little bit of minced garlic on there and a little bit of um, um, shredded Parmesan on there. And it would bake in the brick oven and these knots suddenly would rise. The dough would rise in the oven and they'd be these big knots. It was absolutely free. There was no food cost to that dough because it was already priced out in the pizza we were going to sell from the dough that they just trimmed. So that's a cash cow. The only cost I had was that tiny little bit of olive oil, that tiny little bit of garlic and Parmesan, and then a ramekin of homemade marinara sauce. So we figured it cost us about 28 cents for the cost of that appetizer that we then sold thousands of. It became our most popular appetizer. We charged 10 bucks a pop on the menu. And every time we sold one, we made like $9.75 profit every time. And they just sold and sold and sold. So I said, I can afford to give these things away. So I printed up four color business cards with a professional food quality photo of the garlic knot on it. And then I came up with these, this crazy superlative copy. It said, fantastic, amazing, stupendous, garlic knots, absolutely free. And then in the corners of the business card, it said $10, $10, $10. So I went to these non-competing businesses in my area and I try and I built relationships with them and I spoke to the leader or the owner and I said, Hey, and I only did this when I started new restaurants and I was trying to seed the market and get new customers in the door. Because after a while, when you get a popular place, you don't need to give anything away anymore. It's like, Hopefully you get more business than you can handle. But I opened five different restaurants and I use this every single time, but it was always in the beginning to seed the business. So I I met these people and I'm like, hey, I'm Roger and I'm opening up this new restaurant and I'd really like to give your customers something of value. If, you know, if you pass out these coupons to your customers, whether they buy something or not, it's a $10 value. I'll give them a $10 appetizer just for trying our place. But here's the kicker for you. If you stamp the back so I can track where it's coming from, either, you know, your logo on the back or the initials of your business, whatever it is, I don't care. I'm going to track this and I'm going to give you 10% back in um, trade at my restaurant for every dollar you send in the door. Okay. And um, it's obviously going to be before tax, not after tax, but you get the idea. I, I started relationships with five people, five different businesses usually. And some of these businesses sent me ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars in new business because I tracked it over the course of a couple of months, and that's what seeded my business. But now here's the kicker for me. Granted, I got customers coming in the door and they're spending money on the. Fr- the average spend was seventy five bucks because nobody comes in alone. It's always two people, and this was years ago. But again, seventy five or eighty dollars was the average check. Some was higher. Some was over. 100 bucks, some was 50, 60 bucks, didn't matter. 
but for the cost of a 28 cent garlic knot, I suddenly have a 75 or an $80 check average coming in the door. And it worked like a charm. And then I said, wow, wow, I got these people the first time. And hopefully my service and my ambiance and, and our food quality is going to get them back again. But now I want to guarantee that. What can we come up with to get them back in the second time? So I'm at this convenience store or a supermarket, whatever it is, and the people in front of me are buying lottery tickets. You see the big wheel of lottery tickets and lottery fever is always hitting the country. We have these billion dollar jackpots today. It's crazy. And people are just lottery ticket crazy. Eureka, a little light bulb goes off my head. And I'm like, I'm going to print these custom lottery tickets that are branded to my business. They look like lottery tickets. They got those little scratch off squares on the front. We call it, we come up with a crazy name, some kind of sweepstakes thing. And every ticket is a winner, but we don't tell people that. And what's under one of those squares is one of my cash cows. But when do we give these things out? After the people pay the check. So I got the coupon in the door the first time. Okay. They got the garlic knot coupon. They got the free garlic knots. Now they're paying their $75 or $80 check. And my server, my bartender, whoever says to them, oh, here's something fun. After they come back with the, the credit card signed or whatever, here's a lottery ticket. I hope you win. And immediately you see the people pull out a quarter and maybe they scratch the first square and it says, try again, try again. And then the third time it's like, wow, you just won a X. You just won garlic knots. You just won, you know, real wood, um, real draft root beer. We had a beer supplier that gave us free root beer because we poured so much of their beer. And that we used to charge four bucks a piece for that at no cost to me. That was another cash cow, of course. And now we can afford to give that away for free. So under the lottery tickets. So people put those things in their wallets and it was only valid on the next visit. It brought them in the door again. We tracked the spending on those. The servers or the bartenders would staple the, you know, the lottery ticket or the cash cow coupon to the guest check. I could track where it came from. I, you could see how that works. And it was just a huge runaway success. So you Brilliant. too can do these things in your business. Very and smart. Very smart. That builds loyalty. And it was just, and it makes it more fun. There's that culture, right? Hospitality, family, and fun. This is the fun stuff. Yep. All right. I'm going to get to the most valuable or the most powerful, you know, maximize your profit and everything you sell. We're going to get to that. But right now we're going to talk about hospitality because that is the foundation of our restaurants and our business. This is not... This is something that I shared with my staff every single day. I mean, we trained every single day. And when I talk about training, I are talking about pre-shifts. I'm a huge believer in having a pre-shift. It's like the team huddle before the Super Bowl. And it doesn't have to be 20 minutes. Most of the time it was five minutes or less, but something powerful that you would share with the team that they would then share with the guests or what's your strategy tonight? Or what are you going to recommend? Because we're all about suggestive selling. And I'm going to get to that next, but okay. Here's my definition of hospitality. I learned a long time ago, 30 plus years ago, that hospitality is absent when something happens to your customer or to your guest. But hospitality is present when something happens for the guest. And we talked about that all the time and everyone got it. You instantly know what it means to have a point of pride and really deliver true hospitality, amazing experiences. So that's what hospitality is about. All right. Know this, your guests in your restaurant might think they're coming into the restaurant because they're hungry or it's dinner time. And they didn't feel like cooking or whatever it is. And they might be looking for really good food and just a comfortable atmosphere. And sure, they expect your service to be great, but they're not just here the, for the food. They're here for an experience, something they'll remember, something that you want them to share on social media and to leave you positive online reviews. And in order to deliver that, takes training and it takes every single person being an A player delivering their unique personality that dazzles your guests and gives them lots of reasons to return. Plus, you know, the plate presentations certainly help as well. Like that looks like a really appealing burger and it's almost lunchtime. I always want to eat the photo, but know that they're not just here for the food. They're there for experiences and it's up to every member of your team, both the kitchen, front of house, back of house to over deliver so that they have amazing experiences. And that's what sets you apart from the competition. Yeah. All right. I don't eat the pizza. What is this? This is a true story. I've told this story hundreds and hundreds of times and it really resonates. So 
I told you my very first um, restaurant was a wood-fired pizza. So if we went back in time 30 years ago, I'm three weeks out from grand opening, opening the doors to my very first restaurant. I mentioned I had no experience when I started this business. And I needed that dough mixer I told you about because I was going to make the dough fresh every single day and all that kind of stuff. And I found a, uh, a Hobart 60 quart mixer for sale. It was maybe two hours away in the next state over. And I'm on my way to look at this dough mixer and it's almost lunchtime. And I'm driving down this street in New Hampshire and there's a sign at the end of this driveway that says wood fired pizza now serving. I'm like, terrific. That's the kind of restaurant I'm starting. I'm going to go in there and I'll check it out and I'll probably learn a few things. So I parked the car and I walked through the front door. And the very first impression I have of this business is there's a 17, 18 teenage host, you know, and he's leaning on the host podium as I walk in the door. And as soon as the door opens and I walk in, you'd think he would be like ready to greet me, right? Instead, nope, he's leaning on the podium like this, like I'm too bored to even be here. And there's that C player I was talking about. And as I get closer, there's a menu holder on the side of the podium, and it's full of stack of menus and all that kind of stuff. As I get closer to him, now he's blowing bubble gum, okay? And he's like blowing bubbles like, I'm like, wow, this is a really negative impression. When I get up to him, he looks at me, and he's like, are you here for lunch? I'm like, yeah, it's 10 or 12. I'm here for lunch. Next thing I know, he takes one of those uh, menus you know, out of the holder, and he, and he hands it to me, sticks it in my hand, and then he points, points across the room. He's like, see that table over there? It's yours. Doesn't even have the courtesy to walk me to the table, make sure I'm comfortable, maybe tell me something about the restaurant, make a suggestion, introduce himself by name, none of that. Nope, there's your table. Go take it. Strike two, right? So now I'm sitting at that table. And I'm sitting there for eight to 10 minutes because I tracked it on my watch. I'm getting really irritated at this point because, you know, those things are percolating in my mind. What the greeting and, you know, go find your table kind of thing. I'm watching there as service personnel are passing me by on the left and the right. Nobody's making eye contact with me. And I'm like, do they even care that I'm sitting here? And it wasn't a busy restaurant. It's not like it was full of people and like people were just doing their thing. It's like I'm sitting here and... I'm like, who's my server? I'd really like to get a drink. I'd really like to keep this going because I'm on my way to get a dough mixer. And eight or 10 minutes later, the server finally comes to the table. Well, I had plenty of time to look at that menu and they had all these specialty pizzas that all sounded pretty good. So I asked the server for her recommendation because I could have ordered, you know, any of them. They all sounded pretty good to me. I'm like, what do you like? She looks me in the eye for the very first time. She's like, I can't recommend the pizza. She's like, I don't eat them. She goes, they're too expensive. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's what she's telling me, the guests. Okay? <laughs> okay. Strike three. So, yeah. again, three weeks out from opening, I hired this whole staff. And this was the foundation of my Sales Star staff training program because I about fell off my chair and scared me to death. And I suddenly realized, Court – that what your service team say and do, their actions and what they say can absolutely sabotage your business. And if you ever see these people again, now this was 30 years ago. This was before the internet. This was before social media. Okay. And now social media is a dangerous thing because people will slam you for the slightest of infractions. And now it's so important for us to be vigilant as to what our guests are saying and to interact with them, to thank them for positive reviews and to, you know, make things right for the guests when something goes sideways. But back then it was all word of mouth. And I told this story hundreds and hundreds of times. And I'm not in the name, I'm not in the place where I slam the restaurant and mention them by name and don't go to that place, but you know that your guests, your customers will do that. So again, you don't train your people every single day. This is what can happen. And that is an absolutely true story. So that was the foundation of Sales Stars, which I'll tell you more about. Okay, this is what I called capture and lightning in a bottle. And it's as simple as when staff are having more fun, when your team are having more fun and they're making more money, your guests are having more fun and spending more money. And that was a magic formula for me because, again, part of our culture was fun, hospitality, family, and fun. What's your mission? I've always believed that this business was entertainment. It's show business. I used to always train my staff. You know, when that door opens for business, 
either lunch or dinner start of service. It's like the curtain going up and it's showtime and you guys are not hosts and you're not bussers and you're not servers and bartenders. You are actors and actresses on stage and your mission is to educate, inform, and entertain our people, our guests, and give them lots of reasons to come back again, leave us positive online reviews, and to tell all their friends. And then I had this pet peeve. It's called the order taker. Now, your audience doesn't know this, but um, I'm, I'm an industry speaker. I speak across the country at a variety of events, and I just returned from New York City. I was just speaking on leadership and um, I also gave this presentation at the International Restaurant and Food Service Show in New York City. Just got back last night. But anyway, I travel a lot and I eat out on the road a lot. Variety of restaurants, variety of price points, doesn't matter. It could be a Denny's, it could be a five-star fine dining thing. Nine's out, nine times out of ten, I get what they call the order taker. And it's like, they might have a nice personality, they might be friendly, but it's like, there's the pad and pen, what do you have? You got the menu, it's like, you decide what sounds good to you, and I'll just take the order and bring the food and then give you the check at the end of the experience. And to me, that is like, ah, average, ordinary, boring, lackluster experience. It doesn't take people on what I call the magical journey. What is your restaurant all about? What's special? What's unique? What's different? What am I going to enjoy and appreciate if I'm a first-time visitor? I want to know. Tell me. You're the expert. That's the difference. Because every restaurant listening to this, every owner, every leader knows that every day we have new people that walk in the door that we've never seen before that are first-time visitors that don't know the first thing about our place. And even though the marketing is our biggest marketing tool, don't leave it to chance. Train your team to take people on that magical journey. That's so important. Maximizing return on investment. I've talked a lot about return on investment. I've always believed that every guest, every seat in every restaurant is valuable real estate. Now, the owner is taking all the risk of business, okay? They're sticking their neck out. They're paying the lease on the property or the mortgage, whichever. We're paying the payroll. We're paying, the yeah, obviously, the cost of goods and the insurance and the dumpster and the internet and the insurance and all this stuff. That's why margins are so low unless you money in your restaurant it's like you got a lot of expenses okay why wouldn't you train your staff to recognize these opportunities and optimize and maximize them for your business because what are you doing you're you're bringing these people in and you're giving them an instant opportunity to have their own business within your business i'm talking about front of house team here but it's like people are making really good money in your restaurant and sometimes they're making really good money just for being order takers and coasting why wouldn't we expect them to deliver more and to get that ROI through the roof? And that's certainly what I did, and that made all the difference for me. It is a captive audience. Now, there are lots of businesses out there that I would not want to own. And I'm not insulting anyone that also owns a retail business besides a restaurant. But let's face it, in retail, you're not making a sale every customer that walks through the door it's like you get people in there and the very first question is can i help you and nine times out of ten you hear no i'm just looking and unless you know that this particular retail store has what you're looking for and you're just going in there to buy it there are certain days when you make no sales at all okay mm -hmm. but in a restaurant captive audience i don't need to tell you this everybody that walks through the door is ready willing and able to spend and it's your job to train your team to deliver experiences to bring things to life to explain and to make suggestions that increase sales and that's how you run a profitable restaurant so opportunity i'm an opportunist i've always been one i want my audience i want your audience to think about opportunity every day and train their team in that but opportunity is fickle it's fleeting it's gone in a second every guest again is a series of opportunities every guest every table even the kids are opportunities every time and once those opportunities are lost they're gone forever but if they're captured think about what that means to the bottom line here's where i'm going with this court I want you and every member of the audience to take a second and just close your eyes. I want you to imagine an iceberg floating on the surface of the ocean. If you got that in mind, here's where I'm going. Okay, this is a great analogy. It's so applicable to restaurants. Now look on top of the water. That's that giant iceberg that you all just had in your mind. It sunk the Titanic. It's huge, right? Well, very few people think about this or realize that 
the iceberg is actually so much greater. Its greatest mass is hidden and unseen beneath the surface of the water. It's probably three, four, five times bigger. And that's why the top of the water to me in my restaurants, I always call that daily sales that just happen. You give the guest a menu, you let them decide what sounds good, and they'll order whatever, and you're leaving lots of chips on the table, and that's the land of the order taker. I'll take the order, I'll bring you whatever you want, whatever. But below the surface, I call that the domain of the sales stars because these are the opportunities that you recognize. Upsells. Someone orders a gin and tonic and the staff are so well trained, they say, would you prefer Bombay Sapphire or Tangray 10? What's an add-on? Every restaurant worth its salt has lots of opportunities to increase the check size by enhancing the meal. If it's a salad, maybe you offer scallops or chicken or shrimp on a salad. We used to have that. We used to have three different kinds of cheese. For an upsell, you could have blue cheese, goat cheese, feta cheese, whatever. Steaks. We had a steakhouse. Would you like sautéed mushrooms and onions? Would you like specialty rubs on that steak? And these were all upcharges that enhanced the meal, and our staff knew them inside and out, and they suggested them every table every time. Nine times out of ten, people said, sure, that sounds great. Bring me that. Most profitable items. We're going to get to this because this, again, is the most powerful part of this presentation, but you need to know what your most profitable items are. You need to train your staff in what those things are, and you need to train them to suggest these every table, every time. And we're going to go into greater detail on that. I loved bottles of wine. Um, desserts go without saying, but coffee drinks. Lots of people order coffee at the end of a meal in restaurants. But when was the last time you went out to dinner court and the service said, would you prefer Kahlua or Jameson's or Bailey's in that coffee, maybe with a dollop of whipped cream and some chocolate sprinkles on top. It's the perfect end to the meal. And Never. just by adding that Bailey's to the coffee, now it's a $12 coffee instead of a $3 coffee. Yep. Okay. And there's the upsell right there. And people go for it. You got to right. just make these suggestions. Retail merchandise. We talked about brand building. If you have a brand and you're not just running a restaurant, then people will pay you to once you build this brand and there's an aura around it, people will actually pay you to wear your merchandise all over town, advertise your business. It's free and it's a profit center. I know my largest restaurant, we sold about $30,000 a month in retail merchandise. It was crazy, but yeah. we sold tons of this stuff and it's awesome. It's an opportunity that you cannot miss, but the foundation is building that brand first, but there's an opportunity. And then live music and events, not every restaurant can do this, but if you got a little space, if you got a little lounge or a bar or whatever, if you bring in an acoustic musician one or two nights a week, a couple hours, it'll cost you 300 bucks, you'll sell a lot more alcohol, you'll keep people entertained, you'll create a venue, you'll create a place people want to go, whether it's two ladies sharing a bottle of wine, an appetizer, whatever, or just people in your bar, it creates a vibrancy and it entertains your guests at the same time. We did that. We even had rock bands twice a week and we charged cover charges and that was another profit center where you know people are paying 10 15 20 bucks depending on the on the band at different times so these are all things that are hidden opportunities that you need to train your staff in and that increases your check averages but most importantly it delivers better amazing dining experiences Okay, here's that pet peeve thing again. Don't be an order taker. My biggest pet peeve was absolutely never, ever ask what I call the yes, no question. Does anybody want dessert? Can I bring you anything else? Right? That's what an order taker says. Nine times out of 10 people say, check, please. You got a 50-50 chance of making the sale if you ask a yes, no question. Maybe they'll say yes, and maybe they'll say no, no but those are terrible odds. So how do you increase the odds of making a sale? This is simple and it's absolutely spot on true. You give choices. That improves the odds of making the sale. In this particular example court, we're talking about desserts. So let's just assume that choice A is the chocolate peanut butter blast and choice B is the raspberry cream disaster. Now, I always had these really interesting names because they sell the desserts. People say, oh, what's the chocolate peanut butter? Oh, the raspberry cream disaster. Oh, that sounds cool. Bring me that. So it, it gives your staff a step ahead to sell something if you have a lot of items that'll sell themselves by virtue of the description or the name. So anyway, there's three choices here. You got choice A, the chocolate peanut butter blast, the raspberry cream disaster, or no. Simple math dictates that they all have an equal likelihood that the guests will say, oh, A sounds good. Oh, B sounds good. Or no, check please. 33 and a third percent equal likelihood of any of those things. But suddenly... Okay. 
giving two choices, you add those things together, and now you just increased your odds of making the sale to 66.6% versus you doubled your odds of making the sale simply by bringing two choices to life and making them sound amazing. It could oh, be yeah. an appetizer, it could be a dessert, it could be an off the menu special, whatever it is, this is an approach, it's a strategy, and it's gonna increase your odds of selling more stuff. All right, here's the, here's the powerful part. Third question I ask my clients. Have you costed out your menu recently? Inflation, prices have been incredibly volatile. It's like, do you have any idea what it costs you to serve every menu item to your customer? You would not be surprised at how many people say, haven't done that in a while. Or if they have done it, what do you do with the dead? Oh, I don't know. My kitchen manager has that. Really, folks? Okay, you got to know what your profit is item by item in every single category. When I say categories, we know what that means. Appetizers entrees, soups and salads, desserts. These are all categories. All right, so here's where I'm going with this. This is a very simple template that's in the academy. We have this whole series of um, turnkey spreadsheets with locked formulas, but we have video tutorials that bring this stuff to life. So a lot of people are terrible at math or they hate numbers, whatever it is, we make it so simple. But this is how you cost out a menu. It all starts with an order guide or invoices from your supplier. And simplistically, you can take a calculator and a pencil and do this yourself. You can buy some fancy software because it's a technological world now that'll do this. Or you can go to your suppliers that you've worked with forever saying, hey, I could use some help with this. Can your um, executive chef cost out my menu? I really need to, I'm buying all this stuff from you. Can you let me know what it costs me to serve this to the guests? So you reverse engineer every dish. You find out how many ounces of every ingredient. You figure out, one, what is every single ingredient that goes in every single menu item? And this is a little bit of homework. Unless you get somebody to do it for you, you got to do it yourself, but you got to know this stuff. So this is a pizza at a local pizzeria. It's my kid's favorite. This is like a month old. It's spot on accurate, but this is their most popular pizza and one we get all the time. And it literally lists every single ingredient on this one pizza. You'll see in the middle column there, how many ounces of units goes on it. And then the cost per ounce or unit. And then on the right, this spreadsheet, once you plug in this data, the spreadsheet automatically calculates, you know, the dough costs this, the mozzarella cheese costs 72 cents. And then it adds up the plate cost of every single menu item. So here it costs $2.80 in ingredients only, not labor, for this pizzeria to sell it to a guest. $2.80 is their cost in ingredients. They charge 18 bucks on the menu for this pizza. Simple math dictates that if you divide $2.80 plate cost by $18 menu cost, it's a 16% food cost. The profit is simply $18 menu cost, subtracting the plate cost, and now their profit is $15.20. This is the starting point. If you do this yourself, you need to have a cost sheet for every single appetizer, every single soup, salad, entree, burger, pizza, entree, dessert, whatever. And now you got a whole list of things. The next thing I would do if you do it yourself is now go category by category and then rank them most profitable to least profitable. So if this pizza is your most profitable, put number one in the upper right hand corner. Now, again, just to tell you this all template is in, in the academy. You don't need to, you know, do it yourself. It's all in there should you choose to follow that. But anyway, now you've got all your menu categories and now everything is ranked from number one most profitable to the absolute least profitable. What you might not know, and the biggest eye opener is the difference in profit amongst these items in each category. Eye opening, it's dollars in most cases. So your appetizers might be a three or a four or a five dollar difference in what the profit is. You're losing money. It's even scarier with the entree side. You could be losing eight, seven, nine, ten, six dollars every time you sell this one versus that one. If you were to put this information out of your, take the information from your point of sale system, use a date range. If you change your menu once a year, beautiful. You got a whole year's worth of data. In the past year, I sold 5,280 of this pizza. I sold 300 of this appetizer. Now you've got. You take all that information from the POS and you transmit or you transfer the volume of sales that you just did in the year, or if you change your menu twice a year, you got six months of data, whatever you can do, the most data you have, 
write it down under number one or two and three most profitable. How many sales were, were you know, done in the last six months or a year? Now you got a lot of data. What do you do with that? So now the next template is this. This looks a little busy, so I'm going to walk you through this really slowly. And it's a lot prettier in the academy. This is like an old slide that I really need to update. But this is just the entree category in a client that I had um, just coming out of the pandemic, maybe a year and a half, two years ago. The size of this restaurant in terms of sales was about $2.9 million a year, so a decent business. And now this is a snapshot of just the entree portion of the past year. And again, they had all those categories. So I'm going to walk you through this um, particular spreadsheet. In green at the top, you'll see the number one most profitable entree was seafood stuffed shrimp. They sold 516 of them and off to the right. In terms of popularity, it was the number eighth seller. But every time they sold one, they made $17.88 profit. You want everything to contribute that kind of profit. Kind of like the garlic knots I told you about. I'm $9.75 every time I sell one, right? Okay. In the On the left side, you'll see in red, it says profit spread. Now, this is the difference. These items are all ranked from the most profitable entree to the least because you'll see on the leftmost column, it says number one, number two, number three. These are in descending order of profits. And under profit spread in red, it's showing you how much money they are leaving on the table when the next one and the next one and the next one sells. So the number two is 80 cents less profitable than number one. Go down about three quarters of the way, you'll see number eight in red. Every time they sold a chicken cordon blue, they were, they were making $6.24 less profit. They sold 1,805 of these. It was the number two most popular item seller. And every time they sold one of these, at the end of the year, they lost a potential profit of 11,000 bucks from what they could be selling. Now, yes, your next question is, well, not everybody wants seafood stuffed shrimp. I get that. But the point I'm making in is, it is absolutely possible to redesign your menu where every category contributes a similar profit, not an equal profit, but a similar one. And what I mean by similar is less than a dollar, not over a dollar. You don't want to be losing three and four bucks every time you sell this appetizer for that. You don't want to be losing six, seven, eight bucks every time you sell this versus that. Okay. Last thing I want to tell you about this client. This has been proven a couple times, but this $2.8 million client, um, when you added up the template here, and it automatically calculates, and it'll do that for you if you choose to get this in the academy, they left a potential profit of $343,000 on the table last year because most profitable items um, were not big sellers and their lower profit items were taking sales every shift, every day, every month away from what they could be selling. And yes, I know not everyone wants the seafood stuffed shrimp, but again, if you go back to the drawing board and tighten your menu up where you're losing pennies and not dollars, you're going to have a lot more money on the bottom line to pay labor costs, to pay leaders, to have extra cash in your business so you're not tied to it. What can you do in the short term? Okay, simplify your menu, okay? Do not have these overly extensive menus where suddenly you've got lots of inventory and you've got more option or more chance for waste and theft and spoilage, okay? So simplify it, but drop the lower profit and low volume pieces because your customers aren't buying them anyway. And if it's there, somebody might order it and instead of ordering something that's more profitable. Portion controls, I cannot emphasize enough. You must have solid portion controls in your business. Um, standards, and that's a photograph of what the dish should look like. And so somebody can look at it and see what the, um, the plate presentation is supposed to be. But then specs, how many pieces of pepperoni go on that pizza? How many ounces of this? What's the garnish? It's really got to be specified and the training has to be there. And the consistency is most important. And this really came from 30 years ago in my first restaurant. I used to stand by the pizza line all the time and I'd watch. I'd watch everything in my business because I'm learning the business. I told you I started, I didn't really know anything. I had one size Italian pizza. I told you there were 12 inch pizzas. I had multiple pizza makers. I watched one person put 12 pieces of pepperoni on that one size pizza. I watched somebody put 14 pieces. I watched somebody put 10 pieces. 
I went to my kitchen manager. I'm like, what's the spec call for on this pepperoni pizza? She's like 10 pieces of pepperoni. I'm like, well, I just watched a whole bunch of pizzas go out. Some had 12 pieces, some had 14 pieces. I'm like, we need to stop this. And then I'm like, if this is happening on this one dish, what's happening across the restaurant on every dish? Now I'm in the back kitchen, the prep kitchen, and I'm watching servers do desserts. And I watch one server put one scoop of ice cream on the blueberry pie. I watched another server put two scoops of ice cream. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's one scoop. Kitchen manager, yep, it's one scoop. Oh, she must want a bigger tip. She's adding extra ice cream. These are abuses that cost you money. This is why margins are so low. This is just one reason why margins are shrinking because we don't have standard portion controls. We don't have checks and balances. It's so important. Let's talk about ingredient choices. It's so easy to just figure out with a supplier what we're going to order every week and say, okay, that's what we serve. But what people don't realize is inflation and volatility in the markets means sometimes you're paying this for per pound of beef and next week you're paying this per pound of beef. And if you're not watching, you're shrinking your margins. You're, you're making far less profit than you should be. And you wouldn't know this unless you're watching this stuff. So I used to always regularly go to my suppliers. And I would say, you know, you have these huge warehouses and sometimes you buy huge quantities of something because you get a better price on it. You know what I'm buying now? Is there anything comparable to what I'm buying now that you suddenly got a better price because you bought it in a greater quantity? And if so, if the quality is the same, I want to try a sample. And if I can't tell the difference, then my guests can't tell the difference. And as long as the quality meets my specs, if it's at a lower price, I want it. And I always kept them on their toes. Know this, your suppliers work for your business. But if you just sit back and just take whatever comes through the door, you're losing money. That's ingredient choices. I already said, train your staff to suggest. Once you do this exercise, you know what's most profitable to sell. If your team are suggesting this at the tables, you're lessening the chance that they're going to order lower profit items. Okay, cash cows, we talked about that. You can't have too many of those. The off the menu specials, do that. This is how you increase your profit. Raise prices. If you have a low profit item that's selling like gangbusters and you know your guests love them, then you know that it'll bear a higher price. Increase the price on those. Communicate this inflation stuff with your customers. Be transparent. You know, nobody's getting rich in this business. Unless you own 10, 20, 30, 100 restaurants, you're not getting rich. It's like you have a business. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you're making some money here. Your customers don't know what you're going through, even though they're paying high prices in the supermarket and at the gas pump. It's like they don't really care. They're going out for dinner. But if you communicate gently that I really appreciate your business, thanks for supporting us. These are really challenging times. Labor is at an all-time high. Food costs are really high. We're doing our best to deliver value to you. I always communicated that to my customers. It went a long way. And then what I mean by back to the drawing board is once you know the profit spread or difference in every category, what can you do to tighten that up so that it's pennies every time this sells versus that and not dollars? And sometimes you can go to your suppliers and the executive chefs or experts at this, tell them, I want to tighten my profit in every category so that I'm maximizing my, my profits and they'll help you do that. So. That's really probably the most powerful thing in this whole thing because it's the only thing you can control. You can control your profit. You cannot control the cost you're paying for things in most cases. Okay, we're at the end here. I told you I have a weekly podcast. It's called the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. We have, gosh, we've done 400 episodes over the past couple of years. And every week I interview a restaurant leader or you know someone who's a marketing expert or a guest service expert or tech technology, anything that'll help improve restaurant business or your particular operation. It's absolutely free. You can um, subscribe to it free on any of the major podcast players listed here. But even better, if you go to my website, which is restaurantrockstars.com, all you have to do is give us your email address. And I'm not going to spam you, but every single week you will get the podcast in your inbox and you can just listen to it or watch it face to face like you're watching Court and I because we record everyone on Zoom video. It goes up on YouTube, all that kind of stuff. And um, again, it's a lot of fun. You'll see uh, on the left here, John Taffer from that TV show, Bar Rescue. He was a really dynamic guest recently. So we get some pretty interesting people. Lastly, let me tell you about the Academy. Everything we talked about today is included in the Academy, but it's really a crash course 
in how to run a really super successful and profitable restaurant. Whether you're starting your very first one like I was 30 years ago, it's everything I've learned in 30 years about this business on how to tighten the ship, leadership, dynamics, and training your staff, and recognition rewards, and sales stars training system. How do you train people to have personality and to suggestive sell? It's all in there. So it's logistics to start a business, it's finances, it's marketing. And when I say marketing, a lot of people in this business, the fourth question I ask everyone, tell me about your marketing plan. Oh, we spend on this radio commercial and we spend on that blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, what well, can you track the ROI on this stuff? Do you know what's really working? And nine times out of 10, it's an, I have no idea. It's like this guy called me up and said, hey, I'll put you on the radio. And now we're spending thousands of dollars on things that we don't know that are actually delivering a return on investment. It's an experiment. Don't do that, folks. All the powerful marketing programs that I talked about, the coupons, the lottery tickets, the mug club, it's like affinity building, birthdays. How do you get birthday business? It's all in here and it's all trackable. And then profit centers, additional profit centers. How do you start a catering program? It's in there. It's like everything we talked about. So the best part is you do not follow this like you're in school again. You don't have to go from point A to point B. You decide what's important in your restaurant. Is it training your staff to deliver true hospitality and start selling more? Go there. Is it putting an inventory system in place to calculate your food, beverage, and labor costs to stay in the sweet spot I talked about? It's in there. Is it a marketing program? It's in there. You decide what the priorities are. And then the next best thing is, I talked about entrepreneurs and empowering your people to run your business. The Academy is also a training course for your people to become leaders and to run your business for you. Because far too many restaurants that I see are tied to the restaurants, missing their kids' graduations and soccer games. Nah. Empower your team with the Academy. You get 25 free memberships with your membership where you can assign a give access to any of this stuff, the finances to your kitchen manager or this, that, the catering to your dining room leader, whatever it is. It's like, learn this, do it. Here's your job description. Here's the accountability. This is what you're going to get for an incentive if you make this happen. It's magic. It's there. The best part is it's only 59 bucks a month. There is no contract. You can cancel a month later. You can get what you can out of it. Or you can, I have people that have been in it for years. And they they use it constantly and they keep training their staff with it. And it's the sales stars piece. It's beautiful. So money back guarantee, 59 bucks a month. And it's everything I've learned in 30 years of running a super profitable restaurant. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Court, thank you for having me. That was That was lots of fun. But hopefully we delivered some value and gave people new ideas on how to improve their business. Oh my gosh, that was so much value. I mean, that was a ton of value. I, I'm going to send this to every oh, restaurant you. owner I know because everybody should watch this because you covered so much. So Roger, thank you for coming on. RestaurantRockstars.com. Subscribe to the podcast. 